So this is a drawing by Heinrich Oliver, German artist active in the early 1800s. And it's obviously a pencil drawing of a young man with a hat. And we are going to attempt to copy it today. So we're going to start with the cranium. and the face. I would describe this drawing as something less than a masterpiece. It's very competent drawing. If you're in high school and you can do a drawing this good, um, you should be very proud of yourself. So we can learn a lot from him. But it's sometimes it's good not to draw, not to copy things that are just mind-blowingly amazing because um, it's a little more intimidating. The structure, uh, Heinrich's thinking in this drawing is very clear, and we can sort of, we can sort of read into this drawing. Uh, the way he learned to, to draw, if that makes any sense. Um, and sometimes we can learn more from a drawing like this than from a masterpiece. So does everyone get what I've done so far? This is the cranium. Here's the jawline. The plane of the face, the main plane of the face, follows this shadow edge very clearly. Heinrich chose a lighting situation that would make this drawing as easy as possible to do, um, which is what I'm encouraging all of you to do also. You see that plane break between the face and the side of the head? And the jawline comes up right in front of the ear hole, so the ear is going to be placed right behind it. And I'm now going to do what a lot of you are not that good about doing yet, which is I'm going to block in his shoulders and his hat and his hair and everything right away so that um, I have a sense of what the whole drawing is doing. Okay, so we're going to go ahead with the, we're going to draw the fur. Look at how the, the top edge of the fur kind of hits the top of his cranium. And let's think about this hat. We're going to, I'm going to block this in for you. Remember, we're, we're always starting out thinking in terms of simple, large, simple shapes. So I'm going to draw this, and then I'm going to talk you through it, because this is going to help more than you think. So if we draw an imaginary line from here to here, notice that it's about the same length as this height from here to here. So we can start with that. We're going to go like across, and then we're going to go up. And these are about the same length. That'll give us a sense of the height of the hat. And then we're going to draw these angles. This line here is just slightly angled. And it, if you continued it, it would hit the back of the ear. So that kind of gives us a little clue for how to draw that. This is already sort of defined. And if we continue this, see how that sort of goes straight through there? 
and then it just has this piece that comes out. Now, a big thing that a lot of you probably lack is confidence. And I remember what it's like to just start a drawing. Like, you, you just really doubt that your drawing's going to look halfway decent. And so you figure, like, well, I'm going to get the face exactly right. And if I can't, you know, I'm just wasting my time with the hat and all this other stuff. But, um, it's actually a really good idea not to, like this is gonna help us get the face right because now we're already starting to see that this is sort of a, we're understanding this as a volume and the hat actually helps to find, um, gives us a stronger sense of the head and the overall proportions. And I'm gonna erase this cranial construction line now and notice that our first shading and remember yours is going to go the other way if you're right-handed first shading is just very simple and that gives us a sense of the volume of the head it's a little hard to read where the light ends on the coat I guess the collar goes into shadow about here. So I'm just going to block in a little dark back here also. And there's a little shadow under his chin. And remember, we're trying to get into the mindset of people modeling with clay and not just drawing. We're trying to like get a sense of this volume. Um, I am going to measure one thing before I start shading the internal details, which is the eye level. Notice his eyes are totally straight, which means his eye level is the same as ours. So the eyes are right along there. And the bridge of the nose, he, here to here is about, what do you think, a sixth of the overall width of the head. It's, it's a pretty sixth or a seventh. So this make this space quite small. And there's a little dark inside the bridge of the nose here. And then A little shadow there. Um, the eyes are about halfway between the bottom of the chin and the top of the cranium. Top of the cranium is sort of right right here above the above the brim of the hat. So we should have about half and half like that. And I will check that on your drawings in a minute. And the little, there's a little dark at the bottom of the nose, sort of level with the bottom of the cranium. And the mouth is exactly a third of the way down, like we expect it to be. And a little dark under the bottom lip. And finally, Notice that so this point right here of the of where the eye where the iris is, it's a little bit to the left of center. I'm just gonna put a little suggestion of a dark here and another one over here. And you see how the drawing is gradually coming into focus without any hard details. And some of you, as I looked at your work lately, you're 
you're starting your starting eyes like this and being very specific about outlines we we don't want to do that yet you see how all we have now is a pattern of lights and darks and that's that's all we want to see right now And remember, the goal is when you look at your drawing without any details in it, it should somewhat resemble the, the source material. Just like that. OK, now we're going to take a closer look at the features. Um, ready or not, and when you're working on your independent work, you always want to do what I just did, zoom in so that you can see things close up, and we're going to study this eye now. Hope it's too late to reposition the eye. Whatever, wherever you put it, we're just going to go with it. Um, so we're noticing that here's, here's the bridge of the nose. We've already defined that. Um, here's the inside corner of the eye. And we're going to have a good opportunity here to see some details of eyelid forms that you're struggling with in your own drawings. See how this lid comes out past the iris? And here's the tricky part. We always want to like really sh be a very, very faint line to show the bottom of the white of the eye. On this drawing, it gets a little darker when it wraps up and around. And notice that the lash line, he hasn't really drawn a lower lash, but he's very clearly identified this plane change with a little half tone underneath here um, to show where the, to show that plane of the bottom eyelid. Um, you'll notice that my Iris is drifting a little to the left, but I haven't really nailed it down yet. Now I'm going to be more specific. And I'm always looking at the shapes of the white of the eye. So this is this really skinny little shark tooth on this side. And on this side, it's a little more of like a, a triangle shape. And the pupil, a lot of you still put the pupil too close to the center of the iris, of the part of the iris you can see, but remember the top of the iris is cropped by the lid, so notice how high the pupil is riding here, and notice it's got a nice highlight on it, so we're going to leave that highlight white, and then we're going to shade down the iris a little. In this lighting, the iris is a little darker on the right and a little lighter on the left. And this shadow shape sort of turns into a very, I can't really tell where this guy's eyebrows are. And here's that form, that soft, rounded form above the lid that we call the sausage for some reason. That's what artists, my anatomy teacher said that art, artists call this the sausage. I don't know why.
Um, but this rounded form, it curves around the brow ridge. And then we go straight into this little tiny piece of forehead um, before the hat emerges down around here. So you can see that drawing that eye now in the context of these other darks, like we can read how the eye is working with the rest of the face. That's the most important thing to be aware of. When you, when you just go into a, an eye without any of your other placements established, um, it's very easy to get to get lost, and it's very difficult to place the other things properly. So notice this: the sausage is overlapping the cheek cheekbone. So we're coming from behind the sausage, and just slightly out, just a little for the cheekbone, and. Notice the restraint this artist has used. Heinrich has used very light pressure on this outside contour. In fact, I've made mine a lot darker. I'm going to lighten it a little. Um, because he doesn't want this line to advance visually. He wants it to recede. And so he's using a faint pressure to make that happen. So we'll try to do the same thing. Anytime you do a very a hard, firm outline, it, it visually jumps forward. Uh, but what he wants to happen, have happen here is he, he wants the nose to visually advance in front of the cheekbone. So he's saving his darker outlines for the, for the nose. Um, we're going to think about this as, I'm going to basically block this in. I'm going to think about it as a series of lines before we draw it as soft forms. Um, and what we're learning to do is see things as simple geometric shapes rather than um, details. So. First thing I've learned is that the tip of the nose comes out as about as far as the inside of the iris. So if I drop a line straight down from here, that's sort of what I'm going to be aiming for. And this plane change here is to get to that plane change, if I come about 45 degrees from the outside of the eye, that's about where that plane change occurs. So I'm going to throw in a little construction line. So that's, that's my plane change there. That's where I need to end up. Then I angle back a little. Um, if I go from the center of the bridge of the nose straight down, that's roughly where the bottom tip of the nose is. And this, is a, this would be another 45 degree angle. If I go from here, 45 degrees, that's going to get me to the back of the ala. And that's how we find our way around a form using kind of angular thinking. Uh, my next step is going to be to shadow map the tip of the nose. which is going to be like this, a little first shading. And 
and the last step is going to be to draw that nostril in. Notice the nostril is riding back towards the back of the ala and sort of like this with a little core shadow above the nostril to show that reflected light along the tip of the nose and the bottom of the ala. Um, so now that I've done the angles, I'm going to just try to beautify this a little bit. I've got my general placements, but it certainly kind of lacks finesse after you block it in like that. So I'm going to go soften forms as needed and refine these details. And kind of feels like I placed the nostril a little high, so. I'm going to lower it about a sixteenth of an inch. Create a little more room for that reflected light. Um, this little core shadow here is really important to catch. Um, but underneath it, it's not white paper. It's reflected light, so you still have to do a first shading there. And then there's this cartilage form. You'll notice it's like a... We've got a little bit of a half tone coming down here and a little bit of a half tone where the cartilage meets the, the wing of the, the ala. Um, this guy has a little more of a delicate nose than I've been managing to draw today, but we can always revisit that later. So as sometimes happens, uh, you know, I've done all this detail, and now I'm looking at where I initially placed the upper lip, and it's reading a little bit. The philtrum's reading a little short to me. So what I'm going to do is draw the filtrum, and then I'm going to be l moving this down a little. Um, the beauty is that I did not commit to that mouth placement. I just barely indicated it. And... I'm going to get a little closer here. Here's that central curve of the mouth centered under the philtrum, more or less. Here's the distal curve that's going away from us, extremely short. And here's the proximal curve coming towards us, which is much longer. And you'll notice there's a nice little overlap between the center curve and the distal curve. Um, and that helps to show that this is going away from us. Um, as I always emphasize, the line between the lips is very firm and definite. 
the margin of the upper lip is very soft and indefinite. And there's also a very clear understanding in this drawing that this plane change under the bottom lip is not, that's not where the color ends. The color ends above the plane change. And he's been very specific about that. Can everyone see that? It's like, this is where the, the reddening of the lips stops. And this is the plane change. And a lot of beginners make the mistake of lining those up perfectly. Okay, now that I've drawn the mouth, I can be a little more definite about, you see how there's a little, there's a fullness at the cheekbone, and then there's another little fullness. The, the uh, muscles around the mouth create a slight f fullness right here. And now I'm going to back out a little and see how I'm doing with my chin. Seems like I... I might need to drop that a tiny bit, but not too much. and little shading along the bottom edge of the chin. And look at that beautiful reflected light right under here. Okay, I made him a little too happy, a little too much upturn on this outside corner. That should be a little softer shadow for him. Um, so I'm going to sketch in that other eye, and then I'm, I'll come around and take a look at how you're doing. Um, you can always go back to things. So try to try to work wherever I'm working, but you can always go back and... Um, revisit things later. So having blocked in the nose, the mouth, and one of the eyes, it's going to be a lot easier to place the other eye correctly. Um, if I go from the back of the ala straight up, that brings us to the corner of the eye. And here's the inside of that lid. Um, we could think of this eye as a geometric form also. It's basically a diamond, but it's not symmetrical. The turn of the head is bringing this, this curve to the right of that curve. So we're going to, we could block it in like this. Then we're looking at those little negative spaces around the iris again. And notice this is not, this is the the shelf of the lid, this is the crease above the shelf. And 
Now I'm going to get rid of my annotations, zoom in even more. And here's where even a drawing by a guy I've never heard of is going to kind of blow me away a little bit because look at look at the reflected light under the under this form of the eyelid. Look how clearly that reads in in this little drawing. Um, that's reflecting from the lower lid. And then notice that the this boundary where the white of the eye ends, it's not even drawn. Can you see that? It's like there's no there's no line here. And over here, he's just shaded the white of the eye slightly. And here again, he's shown the lash line, not with not by drawing the lashes, but just by drawing a little half tone. And this is where we really we learn a lot more technique drawing from these old master drawings than from photographs because because um, he's showing us the kind of tricks of the trade in a way that we do not get to see. The photograph doesn't show us anything except the form. The drawing shows us how to represent the form, which we can then introduce into our own work. Um, Here's that pupil. Again, with the highlight. And there's this little half tone around the sausage. And notice the form shading. He's curving his lines. These are not eyelashes. This is meant to indicate the roundness of that form above the lid. Very articulate, deliberate shading technique here. And I'm going to cross hatch because it was starting to read as eyelashes, which looked kind of weird. This shadow goes into this little weird little shadow under the brow. Okay, I'm going to take a quick break now and check your work. So we're going to get more specific now with the So our goal now is to get this shadow edge a little more specific. See how it curves around the cheekbone. Like that. And I'm not trying to do a close copy where I would want to get every shading line exactly the way Heinrich did it. I'm just sort of getting approximations. Um, I'm basically drawing this in my own style. 
um, using this drawing as a reference. So we're going to go into this ear now. We've already placed it. I'm happy enough with this placement to just leave it be. Notice that the jawline right here is not a definite edge. We just have a little cast shadow under the earlobe and then the jawline kind of disappears into this. There's kind of a fullness of the skin here. A slightly youthful, chubby look. And since the whole ear is in shadow, I'm going to go ahead and bring my first shading across the entire form to start. I'm going to define the, the tragus, which is slightly overlapping the lobe. the antitragus, the helix, the helix curling around behind the antitragus, and then the anti-helix starting at the top of the antitragus curving up and disappearing behind the helix. And remember, your familiarity with these forms is going to make them much easier to draw. Virtually impossible to draw a good ear if you don't know the forms you're trying to draw. So here's some individual hairs. And here's an example of where we might really study his mark making. Heinrich's mark making on this fur is pretty interesting. Um, I'm going to do a little fur shading along the bottom edge of the hat. And then I'm going to. We can zoom in and see what we're looking at here. We can see there's different layers of shading. There's seems to be some contour shading underneath. It sort of follows the direction of the hat. But then there are these dark little marks on top. Short marks. So notice some of these lines are kind of 
series of little looping lines. Um, some of them are just little dashes. And you'll notice as we move to the left, there is no uh, shading underneath the lines. That first shading establishes the form. Um, again, I'm not going to try to do every detail here. but I'm going to try to give an effect of this fur hat. There's some things that just don't lend themselves to being represented in pencil like fur and foliage. And so artists have devised little shorthand tricks for representing these things. Um, and it's hair is another one. Um, so you can just learn so much by watching how other artists have solved these problems. And trust me, they didn't solve them all on their own. They, this guy's teacher would have taught him how to draw something like this and um, they weren't reinventing the wheel every time. When I was in school still considered the worst thing in the world to say here's how you draw clouds here's how you draw hair because everyone was supposed to reinvent the wheel and figure out a way to do it that was unlike anything that had ever been done before and that's such an unreasonable thing to expect of young artists that we would all sort of buy these how to draw thing books on the sly and um, but there were in in the classrooms where I learned there were never any of those books around or there was never no one's ever telling you like the right way to draw things you're supposed to really just figure it out from scratch but the fact is that if you learn, learn to do it, learn a simple method to do it from, from someone else, it doesn't mean you can't improve on that method or you can't you know, find your own way to do it later on. Um, it's just if you, if you have a technique to do something, it's going to help build your confidence and give you the will to keep drawing. If you... If no one gives you any technique, you're going to give up really soon. It's just so discouraging. No one's telling you how to, how to draw things. Um, but that's, that's the world that I grew up in in the 70s and 80s. It's like you wouldn't dare tell somebody how to draw something. Just put them in front of the thing and see how they do it. So here again, I'm trying to follow his hatching lines. Um, such clear contour shading going on here, really representing the folds of the cloth, this cloth topped hat and the shadow edges. But I'm doing a kind of a rush job, not trying to show every detail.
always remember to erase your construction lines before you start shading an area because you can't erase them after. Soften this form. And then notice most of these shading lines are following the form, like the lines on a topographic map, and really helping us uh, read the form clearly. This drawing's far from photorealistic, but every form's represented with a kind of solidity that you never find in a photograph, because you just can't. Photographs don't represent understanding of form, they just represent uh, patterns of light and dark. drawing like this simple little portrait is a document of this artist's understanding of what he was seeing. And that doesn't make it better than a photograph, just makes it very different. And in order to do good drawing or to appreciate good drawing, you have to appreciate that difference, I think. And as you've probably heard me say many times, that's why just photorealistic drawing ring copy every value of a photograph seems to me sort of a waste of time because if it was a good enough photograph to be worth that kind of study, it was doesn't need to be drawn. It's that's a finished work of art. Okay, that'll do it for the hat. Um, we're gonna go down and just do an equally cursory kind of job on the. Um, collar I'm just going to do a little more shading on this upper lip where it turns away from the light so we've got this little sort of turtleneck it's like a cylinder form again I'm gonna go a little darker on this core shadow bring out that reflected light on the chin a little better And then he's got a little, little tie or ascot. Just barely peeking out above this flap. Notice this is a very foreshortened ellipse for this little button. And 
And this is a big, simple form of the collar of this sort of coat that he's wearing. And we've already sketched a first shading where it's darkest in the back. Um, the rest of this shading doesn't represent a shadow. It represents the fact that this coat was presumably uh, black or brown or dark gray or something. That's it's a local color difference between the skin and the coat. Um, we never want to emphasize local color differences as much as we want to emphasize the effects of light and shadow. So you can assume that he probably shaded this region that I'm shading right now a little lighter than it actually appeared, um, which is part of why this drawing doesn't look tremendously photographic. A photograph captures every local color change to precisely the degree that um, it appears in nature. And a, a drawing will often subdue some of those changes in the interest of um, saying more about where the light is coming from, texture, and things like that. In a black and white drawing, the local color is generally the least important element. And a little darkening along the kind of the lip of this turtleneck, and then a little contour shading from behind the chin. A little pop of dark right there. And finally, to wrap things up, we've got this back side of the coat. And and I'll go ahead and draw these sort of stripes. And notice I'm going to barely barely touch the paper. Again, these stripes are local color. I'm guessing they were probably a lot more prominent uh, in his actual uh, shirt. And I seem to have forgotten this little bit of hair behind his ear. And having done that, I've got to bring this back of this fur a little further back. Okay, well, I kind of messed up that whole area. I'm just going to raise that a little. Okay, that makes more sense. Notice this very subtle little highlight in the hair right through here. And just a little shading, a little half tone under the fur collar onto the forehead. Um, I forgot to talk about it, but we also had a very clear plane change here where this half tone ends and the light of the eye socket comes around. And 
very clear plane change right here also. To show the highlight on the bridge of the nose, I'm just going to bring a little bit of halftone down around it. And you'll notice I've gone back to my first shading direction for these final touches, just in the interest of expediency. These are my faintest half tones. So we're going to take a final step back <laughs> and this is what this is the effect you'll get if you take a step back from your drawing. I'm just zooming out here and we're not perfect here but we are. One way to think about a copy is uh, no matter how bad it is, when you've copied a drawing, you've, you can say to yourself that you've actually seen the whole drawing, which is the, never the case if you just stand and look at it. The copy becomes a, a record of your study of the drawing. And I could continue on this for another hour. But at least now, I really can feel like this is a drawing that I've seen the whole thing. Have I missed anything about it? Undoubtedly. Um, there's some marvelous little changes in the, of the half tones, um, where the shadow side meets the light. Um, that I have not um, done justice to, but here's this core shadow that I missed along the bottom of the jawline. Uh, yet this video has already gone a little long, so I want to thank you very much for watching and we will call it quits for now.